Hi everybody, this is David Rocco Ficini of Mo Stop Mo. I'm excited to kick off season two of Mo Stop Mo's podcast with our interview with Dino Stamatopoulos. I first met Dino when I was requested to sculpt figurines of members of his band, Sorry About Everything. The idea was to use those sculptures for a music video that may or may not be upcoming, but recently he has released an album with those sculptures on it, so check out his Instagram page for more information about that. I got to Zoom with Dino while he was in Burbank, California to talk to him about his life as a writer, actor, and a producer, and the owner of Starburns Industries. He has a jam-packed career, and we go over it with his foundations in Chicago to becoming an accomplished comedy writer and producer of such acclaimed stop-motion projects like Moral Oral and the Academy Award-nominated stop-motion feature film Anomalisa. I conducted this interview back in November, just right before we were getting underway with producing our Most Stop Mo Stop Motion Shorts Festival that just aired on the Thanksgiving weekend. Speaking of which, we will be rebroadcasting that festival for the Christmas weekend. So if you get a chance, check out our website and link up to our festival where we feature stop motion shorts from around the world. That rebroadcast will be playing all through the Christmas weekend. So I hope you can enjoy that. Also, I'm excited to announce that we are going to try something a little new with our Stop Motion Festival. We are going to do a mini festival that is focused on Star Wars animation. Our May the 4th Be With You Stop Motion Shorts Fest is now accepting entries through our Film Freeway website. So check that out by going to mostopmo.com and following the links. We will be having the screening of all those submitted shorts on Wednesday, May the 4th, 2022. So keep an eye out for that information. But enough of me. Let's get to our interview with Dino Stamatopoulos. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate you taking the time. <clears throat> sure, I owe you one. Yeah, it's, it's cool to see those bobbleheads kind of uh, starting to make a, an appearance for the album. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to... Oh. Okay. There. Sorry about that. It's all, it's all on my end. So. <laughs> I am. All right. So now yeah. I'm gonna use the for their front view for the back cover. Um, I just thought that back view was a cooler picture. So. No, I liked it a lot. It's uh, you're changing it, uh, or maybe that was always the name for the album was uh, Marionettes. What's for Marionettes? I yeah, I don't know. I I think I was gonna call it Saint Valentine Street for a while. Uh huh. I like the title. Um, but you you actually made those for my first record. We did we just ended up doing the the music video for dashboard figurines. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of I mean, it's interesting because I think you I don't know, I'm I'm just making an assumption. It seems like you think a lot in stop motion. Yeah. Uh, in terms of like manifesting that kind of art because everything you've touched has kind of got a stop motion element like driving yeah, like, it. Yeah, I like puppets uh in general and stop motion yeah is definitely uh a passion that i like yeah, yeah. like so so this uh are you still going to try and do that music video in another incarnation or is it just like it's a lot of work for maybe not as good a reward depending yeah i don't i don't think we'll we'll probably do that one um okay. that 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 album's long gone at this yeah. point so, yeah but you're tour- you're touring right now or are you just doing? Well, you know, like- I mean, I just uh, I, I do shows wherever they'll have me. You know, right. so uh, I don't have like a real tour schedule. We're gonna do uh, uh, a couple shows here in L.A., uh, but uh, Chicago, the band's not coming with me. We're just gonna do probably do the uh, podcast people. Okay, so because I saw just on Instagram that you were talking about going to the Annoyance. Yeah, which yeah. is pretty cool. Like, uh, I feel like we we have like several parallels in our background, and I think that's how we were originally connected for me making those sculptures of your band. Right. Uh, so kind of going back to Chicago is like you know revisiting home again, huh? Yeah. Are you so are you from Chicago? I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's funny. I'm I grow I grew up right off of Lawrence and Elston. Oh, okay. So yeah. Jefferson Park. Uh, it's funny because I saw 
like I was doing some Wikipedia living of you and it's like Norwood Park. Norwich. Yeah. Oh, Norwich. Okay. That's what it is. Yeah. So the yeah. Norwich theater and everything. And yeah, yeah. 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 And then like, we also have the parallel of doing comedy in Chicago. Obviously you are definitely more known for that, but like, uh, yeah. uh like I, I did shows at the Annoyance. Uh, I know Mick and Jen uh, pretty well, and everyone knows you know they're great. So, yeah, yeah. and then we all we both went to Columbia. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, so where did you learn your the sculpture? It was just a hobby, or did you go to school for it? I mean, I always kind of was a tactile person with my art. So like I've done theater props and sets and everything and sculpture and. You know, all, all that combined into one with stop motion. I actually uh, studied it more at Columbia, and then I taught it for a while there. Right. Oh, okay. And, yeah, yeah. But um, you, I want to know, like, so basically the, the point of, like, most stop motion, like, trying to not only, like, kind of connect the community, but also kind of finding people like you who is, like, why do you gravitate towards stop motion? What is it about it? And how did you get involved in, like, what is your tale? So, like, there's people who are watching this who are, you know, newer to it. There's probably a yeah. lot of maybe people who are like, you know, experienced. So I kind of want to walk through your trajectory if that's, if you got that time for that. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I was definitely, I grew up watching, you know, those old uh, Christmas specials. And then uh, my dad, you know, was fascinated with uh, filmmaking and he did a little, uh, stop motion you know once i remember with uh with just the uh the hose in the backyard it was like he snaked it around for a while and i, I kind of became fascinated and started animating my toys you know a little bit what but, were you uh, using back then were you using like film camera or video yeah camera? you know like a super eight i think at that point you okay. know and a little uh same uh, uh frame advance you know mm -hmm. um you wouldn't see it until you got it back a week later you know yeah but, uh, and then i you know i mean so once moral oral uh i had the idea for moral oral i thought i was going to just do it as uh maybe uh marionettes and then robot chicken was going and adult swim said well why don't you just piggyback off that show uh -huh. and uh that's when i thought okay it could it could look like davy and goliath a little bit since there is a religious theme and all that um so did you really like, so you were, was more oral, like more literally based off Davia Glyth or you came around to that like decision? I came around to it, you know, it was, uh, you know, I just wanted to make it, you know, about this little religious kid. Uh, Cause Davy isn't really a religious kid. He was, he's kind of a normal kid who uh, is learning about God, you know? He right. Was, he was more of a normal kid. Oral is not a normal kid. You know? <laughs> Makes sense with the imagination. But, but um, yeah, did you grow up watching Davy and Gal like I went to I would like my dad was a priest for 16 years and left the priesthood. But uh, so I went to all Catholic school, grade school and all boys Catholic high school. Yeah. So it's, it's like I remember watching more uh, not moral or <laughs> watching Davy yeah. and Goliath, you know, and then just like that was like a class almost you would sit down and you'd watch an episode of Davy and Goliath. Yeah, no, I mean, I watched a couple of episodes, but I was uh, surprised when i watched a few after uh you know we started working on moral oral that how uh uh how there wasn't a lot of religion up until the very end of that episode you know uh -huh. uh, it was more about like just this 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 kid who got into trouble and then uh, and then learned a religious message at the end yeah you know? so you just kind of made them dopely following some silly kind of ridiculous thing that or get more ridiculous as it like as he followed it i guess yeah i mean it was you know it, it was a show that came out like when uh, w bush was in office and there was a lot of uh religious nuts out there uh, as there are now yeah. and, uh, past that right yeah they didn't uh, they didn't go away or anything mm -hmm. but um it was all about the hypocrisy of you know how they're using religion to their own means you know um so yeah but then you know then i became fascinated working with these characters and working with um, stop motion in general and, and with stop motion people i became fascinated with the idea of really telling an emotional story 
with stop motion because they're kind of clean slates you know they're not actors they're they're these figures so in some way it's you could you could make them even connect more in some way you know you don't see the actor behind you don't see the acting you know they're these these pure uh things that, and uh i just thought it was a, it was a great way of expressing um a serious idea you know with humor you know right. and you could you could also be a little darker because uh they aren't real humans you know and they're not going through all that you get away with more even graphically yeah yeah i think you know it's more palatable to see you know a kid artificially inseminate a woman when it's a puppet you know <laughs> a little off-putting to see a, a real little kid do that yeah. yeah, and probably a little illegal in some states. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so, so basically, it sounds like your first like real thing into stop motion outside of when like being exposed to it with your like from your your childhood is moral oral or did you experiment that all at Columbia? Were you a film student? What was I your did? Experience? I did a little stop motion, mostly cut out. Uh, you know. Yeah. Animation. And. Um, I don't think there was much more that I did. Um, and then, you know, I worked a little bit. I did a show with Robert Smigel uh, on Comedy Central called TV Funhouse. And we did, uh, you know, a parody of Hard Rock, Coco and Joe. Yeah. Uh, motion. Which, which it's funny because I just did a promo for uh, WGN for our, our festival coming up. And they led in with Hard Rock, Coco and Joe, which it seems to be like that Midwestern favorite you know yeah it's amazing a lot of you know you, you don't really see that anywhere else chicago is very uh they have a very specific past when, when it comes to uh television and children's programming in general i think yeah like bozo yeah yeah uh that's true that's it, yeah it's kind of like an insular it's it's weird because chicago is just like a bunch i think it's like a bunch of small towns that are just connected and they're yeah. so it's interesting just crossing the border of one of these neighborhoods how different it could be but yeah. it's all connected by that weird you know yeah. local news no local news flavor type of thing yeah and a lot of nostalgia you know uh, right. a lot of television nostalgia and and uh you know a lot a lot of people remember the old uh you know, creature features and screaming yeah. yellow theater, all that. Tony Svenguli. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I know like you are, I don't know if you consider yourself more primarily a writer or a producer. Um, I mean, you're known for your comedy, uh, whether it's like Conan or Letterman or anything. But I remember one of the first things that I think I saw of yours that like the stop motion was probably on mad TV when you did that raging Rudolph. I'm assuming that was of your, that wasn't oh. did it do you? No, 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 that wasn't me at all. Oh, okay. Uh, I figured uh, because since you, you wrote for mad TV, right? I wrote for like, yeah, like maybe a, a, a season, I guess. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I just made the assumption because everything that you seem to be a part of, all of a sudden there'll be like a stop motion episode or whatever of, of it. And I just figured that was somehow connected to you, but maybe I'm just. No, I, you know, I think a lot of people were influenced by those old Rudolph. Right. Movies, you know, definitely. Okay. Yeah. So like you did, like you did a lot of comedy writing, like even Ben Stiller, which I loved growing up and everything in high school, we always talked about, you know, the Ben Stiller show and everything, but yeah. so moral oral sounds like that's kind of like, you're, you're like, all right, I'm going to go kind of gung ho into a series what was like what was your expectation versus the reality of producing like a stop motion series yeah i didn't really know i mean i that was my first series that i uh i produced and wrote um you know up until then i thought all right i'm good at facilitating other people's visions i didn't really have any kind of specific vision of my own and um and then i just came up with this idea and i really wanted to uh, really it just clicked in my head so uh i pitched it to a few places and most places passed and then uh the uh, adult swim was looking for uh, an idea from robert smigel and uh and robert uh, said i don't really have any ideas but dino's got this idea i wanted to check it out and i yeah. just sent them the idea i didn't really even pitch it uh to nick weidenfeld we met but I was hung over and he had just got into an accident and they're like, 
just send me the stuff. Yeah. Uh huh. So he just kind of it pitched itself, huh? Pitched itself. I had a lot written on it. I had a lot of yeah. They uh, they originally offered me six episodes, and I'm like, well, I, I don't know. Obviously, you don't really have any confidence in this if you only giving me six. And right. then Mike Pazzo said, all right, fine, you can have twenty. And I'm like, well, wait, 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 that's too many. Just give me ten. Uh huh. Well, yeah, twenty episodes for stop motion. That's kind of crazy. Yeah, and I, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I, I didn't have like twenty ideas, and you know, I wanted to start a little slow, but you know, I, I thought ten was a nice even number. Uh huh. And then, like in terms of producing it, did what was Starburns around back then, or did you have to find a space? No, well, you know, they were doing it at uh, Shadow Machine, so I that's when I piggybacked. Uh, when uh, Robot Chicken was on hiatus, then I came along and did that, you know. And it actually helped out Robot Chicken because uh, Shadow Machine could afford to stay alive and keep the uh, animators, you know, uh, employed and all that. So, so I remember thinking that yeah. no one really understood what the show was. And they're like, all right, well, whatever, you know, we'll, we'll do this. And uh, by the end, the animators really responded to Moral Laurel just because it told a story, whereas a robot chicken was just sketches. Yeah. Right. So Shadow Machine, is that was was that in the Bay Area? No, it was uh I don't know where they are now, but it was, you know, around Hollywood. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So you did you did Shadow so you did that and how how many seasons was Moral Laurel? Moral Laurel was three seasons. It was uh, aborted in the third season. We were going to do 20 episodes, and they cut it down to 13 because it got too depressing for Michael Asimov. <laughs> and also, I changed the character, you know. I mean, you know, with series, you're supposed to go back to status quo with the characters. They're not supposed to change. And I just, uh, I got bored and uh -huh. wanted to him to evolve you know and right. i thought it would have been a more interesting show but you know i mean lazo had a point i i sort of took the show away from him at some point okay so then you're you so you kind of this moral kind of disappears for a while but then you you came back and kind of bookended it with its follow-up or well uh yeah we did a special hoping that we could rekindle some moral oral uh series uh so we did before oral so yeah. a, a smaller cuter oral which uh -huh. is you know what series do you know they bring a, a cuter little kid in and uh <laughs> but uh you know uh i i think lazo still felt it was uh it wasn't funny enough oh, that's weird because i love that that was a great show that was fun to watch i mean yeah, it was like the perfect combination of like obscenity pop culture and then like you know i like stop motion but it was just like it was just i like the tone of it even if it kind of kind of it got a little i don't know it was probably a lot more edgy for its time than maybe something now yeah i don't know i mean i think i think like i said lazo had a point i i, I changed the show mm -hmm. you know with something like rick and morty or Bo, bojack horseman i assume i don't really watch it that much but uh mm -hmm. they they all they don't the characters don't change that much you know right I, I really you know uh uh accelerated the change in oral and made him a completely different person he he became less uh innocent in uh, the later season uh-huh well i mean it, it, i guess it would stand to reason but yeah it's changing a brand so yeah i wanted to you know i mean i i brought up the idea that some episodes would if he had a limp you could it was uh he was the uh the later oral you know who was less innocent and then if you saw him without a limp it was a flashback episode so we could have both you know the innocent oral and the uh, uh -huh. the, the world wise world weary oral uh -huh. but uh, uh yeah lazo just got too sad <laughs> <laughs> Well, but uh, so so then oral kind of ends, and then you got 
you gravitated towards stop motion again, like with uh, Franken or it was uh, Mary, Mary, Mary Shelley's Frankenhole. Yeah. So did you have a problem calling it Mary Shelley's Frankenhole, or is that just like not an issue because of it's written yeah. so long ago and it's like who cares? It's like yeah, public, she's, dead. Public. she's dead. What's she gonna do? Uh, <laughs> I just thought it was funny to take this stupid show and give it a, a little uh, gravitas with her name. Yeah, that's great. I love it. Uh, it's but, like. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the writing that you have is definitely a lot more uh, kind of like on the twisted intellectual side. So like, well, even like a, little, a little thing with Mary Shelley, there's a lot of populations like, why is it called Mary Shelley? And they'd have to look it up or something versus knowing it, you know? Yeah, it's pseudo intellectual. You yeah, know. pseudo, yeah. <laughs> I don't really, yeah. you know, I did read Frankenstein, uh, oh. but, uh, you know, uh, we started calling the episodes after uh, famous horror or science fiction uh, writers. And, you know, I've never read Love, Lovecraft or, you know, any of the, uh -huh. I'd never read Gaston LaRue, you know. So. Uh, what, I thought, movies. what I thought was interesting about uh, Frankenhole is I feel like there's a, sim there's a, there's definitely a similar dynamic to it and like Rick and Morty just with the, the time travel idea and just kind of exploring different. Yeah. I, I, I you know, I kind of think that they might've borrowed from it. You know, we were in the same studio at the time. Uh -huh. and, uh, I, you know, I, I remember Dan was like, Oh yeah, that's brilliant. You know, you could go anywhere and in and, and any time and any place and all, all that. And um, you know, I'm, I'm sure they borrowed that idea. Uh huh. So, uh, the process for now with now that you've done it like adult swim and everything like that moral oral you 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 start starburns along like at, was it a, after it was after community right but community was after frankenhall we right? started starburns uh i wanted to go to another studio for a few reasons and uh so i went to um these two guys who apparently had a studio and I said, I want to come to your studio and do, I have a second season of Frankenhole. And they said, great. We don't really have do stop motion. I'm like, Oh, I thought you did. They're like, not anymore, but we can start one with you. And I said, okay, uh, I don't know how to do it. And they're like, we do. And then uh, I told Harmon about it. He's like, Oh, I want a studio. And I'm like, come on in. Uh -huh. So we started it and, while we were waiting for, we were writing Frankenhole and waiting for that to get officially greenlit. Um, uh, NBC wanted an animated Christmas episode. So right. we pitched uh, stop motion and that kind of got our studio underway. And then we did Frankenhole and before Laurel and then uh, eventually Anomalisa. Okay. So how do you how do you uh, draw upon the stop motion community? I know it's like there's a lot of specialized, passionate artists that are scattered everywhere, and like those type of projects are pretty sought after too. So it's almost like when you have a good high profile project, you have probably a good pick of the litter to a degree. Not really. No. no when, when we first uh, when I first started doing stop motion, there were tons of. Um, Learners. Um, uh, uh, available stop motion artists. Uh, but now, you know, like lately there have been, there's a, there's a lot of studios and stop motion has had a resurgence, you know? So um, it's, uh, and there's, you know, a lot of people, you know, they're not training to be stop motion animators. Right now, if you decided to become a stop motion animator, you'd be, you know, a highly sought after, you know, commodity. Yeah, there's like there seems to be a lot of I'm, so I'm right now I'm traveling cross country in an RV van. I've been traveling since April. I'm in Minnesota, uh, and I got to get out of here before the. You know, I'm in November, in Minnesota. It's not the best idea, so I got to start heading south. Yeah. But uh, as I'm going along, just seeing all a lot of smaller studios, smaller projects because they got the digital tools to handle all that stuff. Um, when I'm assuming like as early like it was moral oral that was shot digitally. Or was that shot on film? How did you? Yeah, that was shot digitally. You, okay. know, on, so you, you uh, never really had to re-encounter the whole film dynamic at all. I mean, it's all pretty much digital. 
Yeah. Pretty. Yeah. Just still cameras and yeah. Okay. And lunch boxes at the time. Right. It's all computers and yeah. Uh huh. Uh, so then you, so you did that Christmas episode for community again, you, you gravitate towards this stop motion dynamic. Like, yeah. so, I mean, do you ever just feel like, what did I get myself into? No, I'm well, you know, I, I love it. I, you know, um, the problem is it's not very cost effective and we, you know, the studio doesn't make a lot of money when it's uh, stop motion. You know, if it was more traditional animation, we'd right. definitely make more money. I, I just love the 3D aspect and the parallax and, you know, everything uh, that happens. And I've, I've never been crazy about CG, although if it's done well, it could, it could look great, you know? Right. But I like that tactile, you know, look. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people are just, you know, you introduce a new element. CG was big for a while. And people are tired of looking at it. Now they're trying to do layered with a combo of 2D and CG, but stop motion has always kind of maintained that unique look and there's a different technique. So there's always something you can do to stop motion that'll innovate it, but it's still pretty much the same science. Yeah. There was a while where, you know, it had a stigma. Like people were like a little, they thought it was ugly or um, scary looking, you know, but yeah. um, I think that's mostly because the technology wasn't as good as it is now, you know, now, now it looks pretty smooth. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, sometimes it looks too smooth, you know. Yeah. I think we shot a lot of um, Anomalisa on twos, you know, to make it look more like stop motion and less like CG. Yeah, and I know you've probably answered the question a bunch, but like not going back and, you know, removing the lines for the replacement faces, it was kind of, was that, a, that was like kind of a production decision or did you guys think of that earlier on? Because I know originally the play, it was a stage play. Uh, yeah, it was, well, it was a uh, audio play, like kind of a radio play. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I I saw it, I um, I was a friend of Charlie's and I was invited to see and hear it. And, um, and I loved the story so much and I kept bugging him for the script and he never gave it to me. And then finally I started my own studio and I'm like, hey, what about doing this in stop motion? And he's like, well, how, what do you mean? I'm like, I don't know, you figure it out. <laughs> um, so it was supposed to be kind of like a, a low budget stop motion project and it got, uh, you know, with Charlie, things got carried away and I think it looks amazing. But yeah, so when um, those uh, uh, characters, you know, I mean, you know, you, 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 since, you know, you guys are all in the stop motion community, you, you, you know that there's different mouthpieces and different eyepieces and all that. And, uh, so there have to be some seams showing and they usually cover that up. And I always hated that they covered it up. I thought they were just so cool looking, you right. know, and I like seeing a little bit of the edge on stop motion. So when they ultimately do who co-directed and Charlie, they, were, they asked me, do you think we should get rid of these? I said, no, I 100% you should leave them in. I got criticized a lot, especially by Harmon, because he was like, I think it's confusing. They look like they're wearing glasses and all that stuff. Uh -huh. um, but I, yeah, I'm such a stop motion nerd that I didn't see it that way. I don't know if it was the right decision or not, but I like, you know, they did, they did actually use I think that scene where he takes his face off. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was a great, I mean, that was in the preview, I think, when the or the trailer for the film, right? Yeah, I think that was a later idea, you know? Yeah. So, uh, well, it's interesting because it's so meticulous in a lot of shots. You know, I show it to like my mom, for an example, and she doesn't realize, especially in that hotel, that it's not necessarily sculpted sets and everything until you know, I'm pointing out there's seam marks in the face and everything. So she's asking questions because even though, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, she still thinks I'm a painter. But uh, uh, yeah, just something yeah. that she can digest. But uh, there is part of, you know, that film, the, the movie looks uh, looks too good at times. Like that opening scene with the, uh, the airplane, mm -hmm. that's all practical. That's, just, you know, like 
miniature airplane, miniature clouds, everything, everything, nothing is CG on that. Mm -hmm. And it, it almost looks too real, you know? Yeah, there were, there's definitely parts in that. I mean, the idea of you guys had to be going to a lot of Hilton's and Ramada's just to study those hallways and recreate that kind of in it's not it's not industrial right. but that mass produced home contemporary yeah. look yeah and uh and it helped uh with production because you know uh, every room looks the same so yeah. yeah when i came to starburns a few years back it was interesting to see some of that stuff up close the art the craftsmanship is just it's mind-blowing and it's kind of funny what you did with all the props and sets like you have a i don't know if you still have it but you had like a a beam just with all the replacement faces just spiraling up the beam yeah yeah we still we still have that yeah um, we yeah and all those replacement faces that, that are on that beam were um uh something was wrong with them there was some like you know i think they they were the wrong shades or something like right. that they were, they were fucked up in some way. So we had like tons of those. Yeah. So to do a replacement face, that's pretty, I mean, forward thinking. You sound, It sounds like you got a, You guys had a pretty intelligent kind of progressive stop motion team that was going to do all that digital, like, is it digital sculpted or like, how did all those replacement faces work? Yeah, it was, um, they were, yeah, they were, we had a uh, 3D printer. Yeah. So we did all that. And that's um, pretty early for that. Our uh, pre-production was kind of a mess because we didn't really know what the look was when we started and we didn't know what our budget was and we just had to keep asking for money. R really, if we knew how much everything would have cost in the long run, we probably wouldn't have done it at all. I think it's great that we did it and it was good for the studio, but if we had the foresight of where what the price was going to be, Mm -hmm. I think it would have scared us off, you know, but uh, so the yeah, pre-production was kind of a nightmare because um, we didn't really know what the look or the feel was and and we were experimenting with these puppets, you know, I say we a lot. I wasn't there mostly, <laughs> uh, but I've heard stories. <laughs> <you know? laughs> But it was at your, it was on, it was on your campus at least, right? It was on our campus, yeah. And I, you know, I, just see what I show up every now and then and they were like, well, uh, what are we going to do? We don't have enough money. I'm like, just keep, keep going. It's great. <laughs> if you build it, they will come. Yeah. So that's interesting. So you just kind of, cause I know you guys, you obviously you threw your own budget into it, but then you guys had a Kickstarter and there was like a groundswell with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we thought, okay. I think we got, I can't remember how much money, 500,000. We thought, wow, we got our money. <laughs> and, uh -huh. uh, we thought it would be like, you know, a fun little cheap movie to do. And, you know, it ended up being, I think, 8 million. Something wow. Like that. Yeah. So was it that 500 just to kind of create more of that proof of concept and then you found investors or how did that? Well, I mean no, I mean, that 500 was supposed to be it. Yeah. And, Turns out it was more about proof of concept. We just didn't know it at the time. Uh -huh. And then uh, because we did the Kickstarter, which was one of the bigger, biggest Kickstarters at the time, right? Uh, we got a, a lot of uh, attention, and that's how we got um, people to give us more money. Uh huh. Yeah. One of the other things that I remember seeing again, just like speaking to that art, is. The silicone cast of that main character when he's naked, yeah. And I, you let me, you let me manhandle that, and it was so amazing because there's like not a seam on it that you can see, and it's so articulated. It's just you could put it in any any possible pose position. So it's like you guys really. I mean, you put your money where your mouth was. You guys did a really amazing job with that type of film. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, we stumbled into it. We just fell right. It was like falling downstairs. At one point, we couldn't help. Right. We kept falling. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything that's maybe on the horizon that you would think you would want to do stop motion again? Or what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I mean, we've got a couple of uh, uh, ideas that, uh, you know, um, like 
big directors are coming to us with and um, and there's a there's a property that uh, I a book I read that uh, Duke is very interested in and he contacted the author and um, we have a, a few uh, uh, film companies excited about it so um, that would be kind of half stop motion and half live action oh cool yeah can't really talk about anything specifically at the at this point sure but there's like yeah there's like three big projects that we're, we're trying to push through you know and well, then you know and then i did um i did a pilot for sci-fi uh called the black hole that was set in uh a dive bar in outer space and uh, uh -huh. we're still trying to pitch that somewhere you know because the uh the block that sci-fi had to do animation isn't there anymore um, oh, really? we didn't even get to air it yeah so, yeah. so you actually you have something that's produced that just doesn't have a home yeah if you go uh, look up the black hole maybe starburns maybe my name on youtube it's there okay uh, the whole the whole episode it's um you know it's an okay pilot comedy wise i mean pilots are tough and we had to cut it down from a half hour to quarter hour so the script isn't perfect but it would have been a great series you know there's a lot of uh fun characters you know that's cool and it's based on uh the bar that the dive bar that i go to here in la called the drawing room it looks exactly like it oh that's funny <laughs> are the characters based off of people at the bar a little bit yeah but they're all aliens so yeah so it's like cheers in space a little bit yeah it's cheers only yeah no one really likes each other <laughs> they're just kind of stuck there yeah yeah well it's kind of like a dive bar <laughs> It's a dive bar, yeah. That's yeah. cool. Cheers is a more upscale bar than this is. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so I guess I, you know, somebody who's gone through all this process and had that experience with stop motion. I mean, obviously you do other things, but it's kind of a weird, maybe even trite question. But what is what kind of advice do you have to somebody who wants to get into stop motion? Well, I mean, if you want to get into stop motion uh, animating do it <laughs> because uh, we need you yeah uh, you know this is a this is the time for it uh if you're a good stop motion animator you're gonna get work right yeah, yeah there seems to be like a lot of even commercial opportunities and stuff like that and then maybe even opportunities at starburns yeah yeah definitely yeah, yeah. well it's interesting because I, i've i've argued maybe it's not correct but i've kind of debated with people who've done 2d or CG, it's, I think it takes a similar amount of time to produce whatever animated short you do. But the one thing you need, which is trickier, and especially on the West Coast, is real estate. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, that's always the issue. We, we have a, a space right now. If we get more, but you know, it's um, if, you, if, if you get the shows picked up and or movies picked up, you, you know, the budget will allow you to get more space. You know, there's a lot of space out here. Yeah. And, um, um, but you know, uh, if, if you want to be more independent and make your own, yeah, it's a little tougher, but I, I know, uh, I know a lot of kids out there who who've rented their own little space and yeah, you know, short movies. It's, it's, it's interesting talking to different people who are just turning really nice productions out of their bedrooms or just apartment kitchens or whatever but yeah it's like that's just that weird technology now that it makes it accessible for everybody yeah i think the more makeshift it is and the more you know the the greater the um uh the harder it is to make you know the more creative uh you become and uh, i've always made my best art off of not having any money you know right just make it happen yeah well because you, you, you have to think uh creatively and it, and you, you come up with these uh these ways of doing things that uh that a professional wouldn't even think of you know it's that's how, yeah. you, that's how you invent things you know? 
Well, that kind of goes back to what you were saying about being drawn to like puppets and everything, because there's just like a large amount of innovation of just finding materials and making something visual that you can tell a story with that's detaching you as a performer through that puppet. Yeah. And you think differently, you know, you're like, oh, you know, this little peppercorn is a miniature uh, deer poo, you know? Right. You start look just at thinking differently. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, do you have any kind of other influences, stop motion influences, like films or? I love uh, one of my favorite stop motion films is Mary and Max from Australia. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. Uh, mostly because it's just a beautiful story and, and it, it's it's all there's almost no reason for it just to be stop motion. You know, it could have been live action easily. Right. But it just makes it more fun and you know more palatable in a way yeah yeah that's I, it it's funny how there's a kind of a more of a commercial branded side of stop motion that puts things on the creepier side more fantastical you know, more th that mainstream but uh yeah having something that is a true to life story i mean anomalisa though that i mean was that kind of do you, with the writing of that? Do you know how much I know that Kaufman writes very, you know, he could he can write himself any direction. But I didn't know if that had any grounding in reality, kind of like a Marion Max or something. Um, well, yeah, probably. You know, I'm sure he thinks a little bit that way. Right. I think uh, he's, uh, you know, I, I think he traveled a lot, and he probably. Uh, uh, he's, he's a bit of a depressive, you know, kind of like that character. Yeah. Just like the, the staunch realist. Yeah. And hates the mundane as uh -huh. much as. <laughs> uh, cool. Well, I'm not sure if I have a whole lot more for you, uh, but I appreciate like me let, you know, let me pick your brain a little bit. Sure. Sure. No problem. Uh, it was fun. So you're gonna, you're like, you seem to change gears in your creativity. You're gonna be doing your band or you're doing that coinciding with projects. Is that kind of your outlet or is that your new focus or what's going on with that? I mean, I, you know, I would love to just do that. You know, I love making music, uh -huh. um, but you know, no one's going to uh, give me a lot of money for it at this point. <laughs> so, yeah, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a passion. I thought, you know, like I, I turned 50 and I'm like, hey, you know, what's more punk rock than to start my first band now, you know? There you go. Yeah. And it's Is not it... punk rock at all. The... <laughs> yeah. Unprofessional. Your birthday's in December? Yeah. Yeah. Mid-December. Yeah. And that, and you're going to turn 50 then? No, no, no. I, I've had a band for six years now. Okay. Oh, wait. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're, you're born. I'm not trying to put an age on you i was just i thought you were yeah, i'm gonna be I'm, i'll be 57 yeah okay all right so you're like 10 years older than i am all right cool well i mean i love what you do and i it's cool that there's somebody out there like you that is still like passionate about really good storytelling that was the last thing i guess i was going to ask you is like again you it, like you you gravitate towards stop motion but what's do you have a prerogative on storytelling um well, I mean, uh, what do I know you you're, you're, a co you're a co you're a, you're funny, and you've right. done a lot of funny things that I've loved. But I'm just wondering, like, because you know, Anomalisa, it, there's a lot of humor in it, but it's dark. Uh, I mean, you gravitate towards certain type of stories, but I didn't know if you had like a perspective on it. Well, I mean, you know, I like I like to tell uh, strange stories, but make them feel real and universal. You know. I like to take a, a crazy idea and make it, you know, I, I, I of course I didn't write Anomalisa, but um, you know, I like, yeah, I do like to start with something kind of crazy and interesting and then ground it as it's going. That's, that's what I think happened with Moral Oral, you know, it's just these crazy characters, very silly, broad and slowly or, or not so slowly. I got into why, what made them tick, what made them crazy. And mm -hmm. I thought, uh, that's 
that's what I'm most interested in is how crazy we all are, but how similar we all are and universal. When right. You can do it. Yeah. I mean, the, that kind of nuttiness couched in reality, it's like just heightening it to a point, but we all can still relate to it is pretty. Yeah. You see a crazy person walking down the street and, you know, I used to think, Oh, it's just, how do you even write? a crazy person walking down the street is it just non sequiturs and shit but it isn't non sequiturs they have a logic in their head right they have they came from somewhere and they're 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 making sense to themselves and uh, that's what i'm fascinated in is what that that through line is in their head yeah. right so you kind of are you're attracted to crazy people it sounds like <laughs> well i think everyone's crazy so i have to be. yeah that's true <laughs> Yeah, you know, there's just different levels of it. Uh huh. Do you have any like rules of what you wouldn't do in stop motion? Like, as an example, somebody came to me the other day and asked me to do something about a news story, and I was like, "Well, the news cycle changes so fast that it like by the time you burn, you know, you got it out there, people will be like, what are you talking about?'" Yeah, I mean, I like to keep things pretty evergreen. You know, I've I've never been a topical humorist. Uh -huh. Um. So. Uh, I definitely prefer uh, some human stories that will last rather than, you know, pop culture. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you, your stuff, it's always like a little bit of like, again, dark philosophical mirror to society kind of questioning the status quo type of content. At least that's what I think of when I think of your stuff, I'm even your music. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, again, thanks again for uh, joining and uh, appreciate it. Uh, if you're around and you're in front of a YouTube uh, screen for our festival that's happening Thanksgiving Saturday, take a look and see what you see what you think. You might find people who uh, would work on your next project. Yeah, well, you know, they should contact us, too. Yeah. Right. And I want to David. Yeah, and then I, I was I don't think I'm gonna be through Chicago at the annoyance for your for when you're gonna be there. Are you performing there or you're just visiting there or what's going on? Yeah, yeah, performing on the twenty first at the Annoyance Theater at eight o'clock. Cool. Uh, it's gonna be kind of a variety show, a bunch of friends. Are you taking your band with you? The band's not coming, no. Oh so um, they okay. can't get away. It's you know, it's right around Christmas. Yeah. So uh but uh our whole podcast, our whole stupid podcast. We, I do a podcast with Dana Snyder, who does the voice of uh, the, the, the cup and the straw from um, Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Uh -huh. And uh, a few other people are on it. So it's just a bunch of friends getting together and fucking around every Sounds week. Like, so like that's what we're going to do. Just one night? Play music, yeah. Just kind of play in the clubhouse. Play, yeah, I'll play music, do some comedy bits. You know. uh -huh. And are you selling your vinyl? I don't even know if I'll have it at that point. Oh, know? yeah, it's not going to. Yeah. But you still have the old ones, right? You still I still have, have the old ones. I'm not going to lug it. <laughs> <laughs> if they want it, they could, they could mail out for it. <laughs> I don't even know how they could get it at this point. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I got I to gotta figure it out. Okay. It's a warehouse full of that shit. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you got the space, cool. Yeah. All right. Well, again, thanks a lot. And uh, I'll see if I can make it to your show. But if not, uh, thanks again. And good luck with yeah, that. Great. And thanks for uh, sculpting those those characters. They're great. Yeah. I'm, uh, if you are if you are thinking about doing the music video with that, I don't know where, you're, where your mind is or if you wanted to use those for something, reach out because we're, we're trying to build this community. I don't know if, I mean, you probably know tons of people, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. Probably won't do that, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do something hopefully in the future. Cool. Yeah. All right, Dino. Thanks so much. All right, thanks. All right, take care. Mm -hmm.